King of the Ring 1997 took place on June 8th inside the Providence Civic Center in Providence, Rhode Island. Just over 13,000 fans attended the event, with 140,000 domestic pay-per-view buys being reported. This was down slightly from last month's Cold Day in Hell show. The King of the Ring pay-per-view went through some big changes. Many would say these changes were for the worse. Bret Hart vs Shawn Michaels was originally going to take place along with a Steve Austin vs Brian Pillman match, but rising backstage tensions between Michaels and Hart, along with Bret still not being 100% healed from knee surgery, meant Shawn Michaels would instead face Steve Austin at the show. It's a shame too, the two cancelled matches would have been extremely interesting to see. Those rising tensions between Bret and Shawn would lead to a real backstage fight the night after King of the Ring. And rather than discuss this fight in today's video or on Reliving the War next week, I'm going to put together a separate video that takes a look at the infamous fight that Bret and Shawn had in Hartford, Connecticut. And that video will get uploaded before Reliving the War episode 87. I just think it would be best to keep that whole thing separate from the main series because it'll be quite a long video that looks into every eyewitness account that we have online. But let's get started, this is King of the Ring 1997. The opening video for King of the Ring is all about tonight being a night of firsts. The first time WWF Tag Team Champions have had a pay per view match against each other, we also may see an African American win the WWF Championship for the first time when Farouk faces The Undertaker, and whoever wins tonight's tournament will also be crowned King of the Ring for the first time ever. Our opening match is one of the semi finals Ahmed Johnson vs Triple H, or Ahmad Johnson as the case may be. It looks like the WWF have given up on the King's throne and the coronation ceremony held at the entranceway. Instead, the crown sits beside the timekeeper, and it also looks like the winner's going to get a can of Coke. A winner is you. So, here's the two semi final matches we're going to see tonight Helmsley vs. Ahmed already happened in the quarterfinals, and Triple H got disqualified. It was then announced that the match was actually a no DQ match, and Hunter threatened legal action against the WWE, all in storyline, of course. And so Triple H was allowed to take Psycho Sid's place in the tournament and have another shot. He finds himself wrestling Ahmed again in the semi finals. Johnson overpowers Hunter after the initial lockup. Hunter goes down again after a shoulder block, and Ahmed performs the Helmsley pose, the ultimate form of disrespect. Ahmed then wants a test of strength, and you'd think he would know better by now. Hunter kicks Ahmed in the gut, but his knife edge chop afterwards just pisses Ahmed off. Johnson performs a military press slam, and Hunter has to take a break on the outside. The match resumes with Hunter poking Ahmed in the eye, but Ahmed fires back with a clothesline. A missed elbow drop gives Hunter a chance to send Johnson out of the ring, and Ahmed then gets thrown into the ring steps. Back inside, Hunter lands a top rope forearm and he follows up with a few rights, but Johnson absorbs the shots. It looks like there's a failure to communicate during the next spot, but Johnson makes up for it with an axe kick to the back followed by a back body drop. Ahmed then hits a spine buster, he signals for the Pearl River plunge, but China distracts Ahmed from the apron and Hunter hits a running knee. We then see the pedigree and Triple H advances to the King of the Ring finals. The crowd were behind Ahmed Johnson tonight, but he didn't have a great match at all. It also felt like the WWF rushed through this one, but seeing as the winner has to wrestle twice, then it's to be expected. The second semi final match starts immediately after the first. We have Mankind vs. Jerry Lawler. The WWF had been airing a series of Mankind interviews with Jim Ross, and these were put together really well. The WWF wanted to turn Foley into a sympathetic babyface, and Foley's story of growing up and getting into the wrestling business was enough to make fans cheer for Mankind. Out of all the semi finalists in tonight's tournament, Mankind definitely had the most character development, which leads us to believe that Foley's probably going to win the King of the Ring tonight. Mankind pulled Lawler away from the announce desk during the Mankind vs. Savio Vega quarter final match because Jerry was talking shit about Foley on commentary. And that's the only real story we have in regards to Mankind vs. Lawler. The real story is the babyface turn of Mrs. Foley's baby boy. Mankind cuts a promo before the match where he says tonight has the potential to be the biggest night of his career, yet Paul Bear isn't beside him because Uncle Paul has better things to do. Mankind says Paul's absence won't stop him from becoming king. He then asks fans what kind of king should he be if he wins the tournament. 
Mankind says Lawler wears robes but the Emperor doesn't wear any clothes and the only thing worse than Jerry Lawler walking around naked would be Mick Foley walking around with no clothes on. He follows this up with a Cactus Jack bang bang and this gets a round of applause. King was supposed to get interviewed by Todd Pettengill but he takes the mic and he rips in the fans during his entrance. Jerry said when Foley's mum gave birth to Mick, she took a look at his face and a look at his rear end and then she said, oh Siamese twins. Your standard Jerry Lawler jokes at the King of the Ring folks. Mick attacks Jerry on the outside and it's all mankind when the match gets inside the ropes but it doesn't take long for Lawler to start cheating. Foley gets thrown out of the ring after taking a few shots with whatever foreign object Lawler pulled from his tights and Lawler continues the attack on the outside, delivering more blows to the head and even showing his own sadistic side by biting Foley's forehead. Back inside the ring, Jerry continues to use the foreign object to stay in control. The match goes to the outside again where Foley takes some serious bumps at the guardrail and you gotta question whether a semi-final King of the Ring match with Jerry Lawler in 1997 is really worth this kind of pain. Even a pile driver on the outside fails to get a reaction. Lawler hits a dropkick while Foley stood on the apron that looked pretty good and back inside the ring Foley takes another pile driver. Foley kicks out at 2, so Lawler goes back to using his concealed weapon on Mick. This hasn't been good at all. A highlight though is Jim Ross saying at least the WWF don't have to call their weapons international objects. Mick makes a brief comeback with a back body drop, Lawler comes back with his second rope fist drop, Lawler goes for the pile driver one more time but Foley counters and we see the mandible claw. Foley wins and yeah skip this one, it dragged on and the crowd didn't get into it at all. Brian Pillman's wearing an Austin 316 shirt though the 316 has been scratched out and we have June 9th 1997 there instead. Pillman faces Austin tomorrow night on Raw and I guess he wanted to give people a little reminder. Brian says he's here tonight to support the Hart family and he's here to see Shawn Michaels violate Steve Austin. Pillman plans on finishing the job tomorrow night if there's anything left of Stone Cold. Steve appears behind Pillman and Brian's completely unaware. Absolute gold here from Austin who ducks out of camera shot only to re-emerge and begin destroying Pillman. Brian ends up getting wrecked here and he also gets his head flushed down the toilet. I really hate to say it but this has been the biggest highlight of King of the Rings so far. Austin says Brian Pillman sucks, he always has and he always will. We then had a match that wasn't advertised, Goldust vs Crush. Like Mankind, the WWF had aired a sit down interview with Goldust in an effort to humanise the character a little more but he also went on a losing streak while these videos aired on Raw. He did win his previous Raw match that secures him a European title match tomorrow night and he also defeated Crush in this match right here. D'Lo and Clarence Mason tried to get a little friendly with Marlena but Goldust came to her rescue and Goldust ended up winning the match with a DDT. An absolute throwaway bout here that I think was only added due to the two cancel matches turning into one match later on. We go backstage where the Legion of Doom and Psycho Sid get interviewed by Doc Hendricks. These three are going to take on Bulldog Owen and Jim Neidhart later tonight and check out Psycho Sid lip syncing the Hawks promo. Revenge is a dish best served cold and by diddly do squat. <laughs> oh fuck. Watch closely again when Animal asks Sid if he's down with the LOD tonight. Road Warriors, the one you gotta worry about is you. Are you gonna be there for- <laughs> It's subtle but it's still there. Sid says Hawk and Animal don't need to worry about Sid, he's the master and ruler of the world. The only people who should worry tonight are the Hart Foundation, tonight is gonna be their worst nightmare. Todd Pettengill interviews the Foundation, Davey says he and Owen already defeated LOD at In Your House and the same will happen tonight. Owen says the Legion of Doom's pretty makeup and Halloween costumes won't be enough to beat the Hart Foundation tonight and the Anvil says if Sid thinks he's crazy, well Sid ain't seen nothing yet. Jim Neidhart guys, absolutely unhinged. The six man tags up next, the Hart Foundation vs LOD and Sid, let's see if we can get this pay per view on track a little. Animal and Owen start the match off and the road warrior just lifts Owen up and throws him right on his back. Owen takes a body slam next but he manages to dodge an elbow and uh yeah that's new. Animal throws Owen in the air and the king of hearts crashes hard, Hart then finds himself in the opposing corner after a slingshot. 
and things go from bad to worse when Animal hits a power slam. No, actually, it gets even worse for Owen. Here comes Psycho Sid tagging in and performing a double axe handle. Not good. Sid wants a test of strength and Owen decides to let our hero Davy Boy Smith do the honours. The Bulldog shows no fear, he locks hands with the former WWF champion and he kicks him in the midsection to get an unfair advantage. Davy impresses with a vertical suplex on the big man but Sid no sells it and he takes out all three Heart Foundation members involved in this match, damn it. Nightheart and Hawk then do a little work and they aren't in the mood for selling tonight. Hawk ends up getting the advantage and he goes to the top rope and the anvil goes down after a diving clothesline. LOD and Sid then make quick tags and they keep Jim in their corner, getting in some cheap shots when the ref turns his back. Anvil takes a shoulder block and a drop kick from Hawk before tagging in Davy again. Hawk decides to no sell a pile driver before flooring Bulldog with a clothesline. These road warriors are hard to damage. Owen shows Davy how it's done by hitting a spinning wheel kick on Animal and the anvil then smacks Animal across the back with a chair. Owen then launches Jim into the ring like a big pink and black torpedo but Animal's able to land a sunset flip. Bulldog makes sure that Earl Hebner doesn't see the pin attempt. Owen hits a missile dropkick and then we get some fundamental heel tag team work with Animal getting kept in the enemy's corner. The crowd don't care at all, they're absolutely silent here and all the audience have really done is chant for Psycho Sid. Eventually, Animal tags out, Hawk does a little more work, but then when Sid comes back in, the audience finally gets a little noisy. He takes everyone out with clotheslines and legal man Owen gets thrown out of the ring. Davy Boy takes a choke slam. Sid sets him up for a powerbomb, but Owen performs a diving sunset flip and... Uh, so close, but so far. The Heart Foundation score the win at King of the Ring, in my opinion the best match of the night so far, but that isn't saying much either. This is slowly turning into another WWF 1997 pay per view that honestly doesn't deliver. Raw has been excellent, WCW Nitro has been slipping, but in saying that, WCW have definitely been the king of pay per view so far in 97 as we reach the halfway point of the year. Mankind says Hunter Hearst Helmsley will have to drive a train in the King of the Ring finals and Triple H will have to run Foley over because he's not going down for anyone. Foley says there's a line from a movie that resonates with him tonight. I just can't wait to be king. Seems like the whole WWF locker room are watching The Lion King and not just Bret Hart. The King of the Ring finals is up next and Mankind has injured his neck it seems. Triple H looks absolutely fine during his entrance whereas Foley looks like he's seen better days. Still, the smart money would say Mankind was gonna win this thing. Mankind's top wrist lock gets broken up by Hemsley pulling on Foley's hair. Hunter does the same thing again only this time he cranks Mankind's neck a little too. JR says that Mankind must be thinking this would be a great night for dude love as Foley hits a back elbow. Mankind then lays in the kicks and he goes for Helmsley's biggest target, the nose. Mick goes for a mandible claw afterwards but Triple H saves himself by rolling out of the ring. The commentators talk about Foley's sit down interview on Raw and how fans have found respect for Mick as Hunter makes his way back inside the ropes. Hunter then gets a little more physical as he starts laying the kicks into Foley. The match spills to the outside where Mankind momentarily gets the upper hand by using the guardrails to his advantage. China watches on as even JR and Vince say Mankind is the favourite to win this bout. Hunter drops Mankind on the top turnbuckle when Mick goes for some corner punches. Helmsley then focuses his attacks on Foley's neck with a swinging neckbreaker, a choke on the ropes and a forearm strike from the apron. Mick tries to gain his advantage back but a clothesline from Hunter knocks Mick down and Hunter turns up the violence a little with more attacks in the corner. Foley crawls away to the opposite side of the ring but China's right there to greet him with a forearm. Still, Mick hits a low blow on Hunter behind the referee's back. Mick has a great chance to win this thing right here but he gets his neck caught in the middle and top rope. There's an audible gasp in the arena as Mick begins to panic and his mask falls off when trying to escape. Helmsley doesn't let up, Foley gets hit with a baseball slide and he gets rammed into the ring steps. And back in the ring, Triple H drops the Harley Race knee twice and he tries to twist Foley's neck multiple times. This match has already been better than both semi-final encounters. Mick hits Hunter with two stun guns but Hunter counters the third with a DDT. 
Not sure if that was the original intention, but they get away with it. Foley's unfazed as he hits his corner running knee strike, and Hunter takes the flare bump, setting himself up in the tree of woe afterwards, which allows Mick to drop an elbow. On the outside, Hunter takes a back body drop on the concrete floor before Mick performs his classic elbow drop from the apron to the outside. That really should have been the match over. Foley hits the double arm DDT back in the ring, but China distracts the referee and our match continues on. China once again saves Hunter when Helmsley finds himself in the mandible claw, but Mankind locks it in again while Hunter sits on the top rope. A poke to the eye keeps Mankind away, but Mick comes back with a big clothesline that sends both men out of the ring. Mick then tries an apron elbow drop, but he takes a nasty bump when Hunter dodges the attack. The referee gets distracted by China, and this gives Hunter a chance to bring Mankind to the announce table, and we see the pedigree. The table caves in after the move, and it's now Foley who's in a lot of danger. China grabs the King's Scepter and it gets smashed over Foley's back. Another nasty bump takes place when Hunter knocks Mick off the apron onto a cameraman, and Hunter thinks he has it in the bag, but Foley kicks out at two. Triple H gets pissed off, he nails the pedigree, and that's it over. Hunter Hurst Helmsley becomes the King of the Ring. At the time, I thought this was unexpected, but when you think about it, it actually makes sense. Foley was already on the path to bigger and better things thanks to the babyface turn, and this loss right here along with what happens afterwards would give Foley even more sympathy from fans. Hunter was also due to win this tournament last year, but he got punished for the curtain call stuff, just thought that was worth mentioning. Hunter demands that Todd Pettengill brings him his crown and can of coke for being a top boy. China puts on Hunter's robe and the King of the Ring decides to beat his opponent up even more with the King's crown. Hunter leaves the ring while Mankind has to crawl to the back, again adding to the sympathy. A fairly good King of the Ring final, not the best, but still good enough. This would start a long Triple H vs Mick Foley rivalry that would greatly benefit both guys. Those who watch Reliving the War would know that Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels have had a difficult relationship these past few months, to say the least. Going over absolutely everything right now would take a good 20 or 30 minutes alone, and I plan on summarizing everything in the next video that gets uploaded to the channel, but all we need to know right now for this King of the Ring review is that the planned Bret Hart vs Shawn Michaels King of the Ring match was cancelled, and Shawn will now face Steve Austin. Backstage issues, including the Sunny Days comment, and Brett still not being at 100% are reasons cited for the match change. Again, check out my next video where I'll tell the whole story of Brett vs Sean so far, along with the backstage fight stuff. I think it will supplement the Reliving the War series quite well as we move towards Brett's final months in the WWF. Brett and the Hart Foundation cut a promo at King of the Ring where Brett says he's almost ready to make his comeback. No longer will he be an easy target, a guy stuck in a wheelchair or on crutches. Brett surrounded himself with the absolute best that the WWF has to offer, and it's now time for some retribution. On July 6th, there's going to be a Canadian stampede. Brett and the Hart Foundation issue a challenge to any five wrestlers in the World Wrestling Federation. Anyone who has the jam, anyone who has the balls to cross the border and step into Calgary are welcome to do so. But they'll face the Hart Foundation in the Saddle Dome at In Your Haze. In the Calgary Saddle Dome at the In Your Haze, In Your House pay per view. Brett then goes to the commentary table to call the HBK vs. Austin match but Jerry Briscoe and officials want Brett to leave. Brent Pillman fights the officials off with his deadly desk lamp, while Brett says he's getting his freedom of speech taken away from him. There's an argument at the commentary table before the hearts end up leaving. The hitman won't be calling the next match after all, but the challenge has been laid down and we know when Brett's making his comeback. Steve Austin says that being a tag team champion brings him more money, and he doesn't necessarily want to cripple his tag team partner in this next matchup, but if Sean forces Austin to turn up the violence, then Stone Cold says he'll do it. Austin makes his way to Gorilla where he bumps into the Hart Foundation, Brett's clan are still getting held back by security, and Stone Cold then gets a great ovation on his way down to the ring. Shawn Michaels cuts a weird promo. He says the Hart Foundation want himself and Austin to tear each other apart, and because of this fact, Shawn doesn't want to hurt Austin too badly. 
Sean says that everyone's expecting a classic tonight and he doesn't know if that'll happen. He's wrestling his tag team partner tonight and he says he doesn't have the answer before walking off. Sean then makes his entrance and uh, yeah, he, he looks like he can't be bothered. Maybe he's just playing it cool, but Sean seems kinda off here, doesn't he? God, if I didn't know any better, I'd say he might have had a few Scooby snacks before coming to the ring, but Sean wouldn't do that. He's a good boy. Now, at the start of this match, Sean goes from cocky dickbag who probably indulged in some Colombian bacon soda to an absolute hero. A young Paralympian tries to jump in the ring and attack Stone Cold. The match completely stops and the wrestlers wait to see what happens, but security end up grabbing the kid by the arms and legs. The kid's actually trying to fight security off. Sean goes to the outside and he tries to calm the kid down. Stone Cold gets the order to go after Sean and continue the bout, but the kid still resists against security. Sean stops the match, he goes out, he gives the kid a hug, and he brings him back up the rampway where the kid's mum's able to join him. This is probably the most wholesome thing I've ever seen during a live pay-per-view, and there's a certain irony that it's HBK who does this. Everyone has him down as an asshole, but fair play to Sean here. The crowd applauds, Austin holds the ropes open for HBK to get back in the ring, HBK doesn't accept, and the match resumes. The action was brief in the ring while all this was happening by the way. Austin flipped off Sean after a shoulder block and HBK done the same after a punch to the mouth. So the two fight over wrist control until Michaels brings Austin down with a headlock takeover. Sean keeps it locked in after performing another headlock takeover, this time from the top rope and that looked very smooth. The two get to their feet, Sean goes down after a back elbow and Stone Cold performs the HBK pose as the fans go nuts. Brilliant. HBK comes back with a little chin lock action, the first of the evening. He moves into a side headlock and we see a long drop down leapfrog sequence that made me feel tired just watching it. It ends with Austin hitting an inverted atomic drop and Michaels gets clotheslined out of the ring. Sean then completely oversells it by, <laughs> by doing this. Sean counters an apron suplex, but Austin kicks out of the follow-up pin attempt. Sean performs a drop to a hold and an armbar afterwards. Austin then thinks about walking away from the match after taking a short walk up the entranceway, but he comes back for a test of strength. HBK agrees. In DTA, you silly bastard, the crowd pops when Austin lays in the kicks. Stone Cold gets a taste of his own medicine when Sean gets to his feet and Stone Cold ends up taking a back body drop. Sean misses an elbow drop and Austin knocks down a cameraman when he hits the ropes. Stone Cold hits the Luthez press and there's a ton of impact here. The two then go through a few pin attempts, giving us a great example of just how versatile Steve Austin was back then. And Sean ends up getting thrown to the outside and he has real problems trying to get back in the ring. Stone Cold does everything to keep HBK away, including launching Sean into the guardrail. Steve poses to the audience while Sean's out cold. Steve then decides to expose the floor around the ring. Sean tries to fight Austin off, but HBK gets thrown into the ring steps and he takes a bump on the floor. This looked pretty good. Sean misses his flying forearm back inside the ring and he takes another tumble to the outside. He tries to steal a victory with a small package, but Austin makes him pay with a clothesline afterwards. A second rope elbow drop from Steve Austin gets followed up with a chin lock. The overall pace of this match has been excellent. They are going to rest holds only when necessary it seems and it works within the context of the bout. Tim White gets fed up with Austin using the bottom rope during the hold and HBK takes advantage. Austin gets launched out of the ring and Jim Ross brings up the fact that there's high pitched cheering for Shawn Michaels mixed with low bass boos for Shawn Michaels. It's a very mixed crowd and a very mixed reaction. Shawn builds momentum and we see the flying forearm, we see a back body drop. And then Austin dodges a corner attack and Sean smacks the ring post. Stone Cold decides to expose Sean's backside and Sean continues to wrestle with his tights pulled down. He hits a crossbody and he tries to pin Stone Cold, but Austin kicks out and he hits another clothesline. Tim White gets taken out in the corner, we have no referee, Austin blocks a super kick and we see the Stone Cold stunner. There's no one to count the pinfall, so Austin grabs Tim White and our referee takes a stunner too. Sean hits Austin with sweet chin music, but it's the same problem. No one there to count the pinfall. 
Mike Kyoto runs down, but he checks on Tim Wyatt instead of counting the cover, so Sean decides to hit Kyoto with a super kick. He then covers Austin, White makes the count, but Austin kicks out at 2. Ert Hebner then runs down and he disqualifies both guys for attacking referees. It's a double DQ and it's a real bad way to end what was a very hard fought match. It looked like these two were trying to see who could outpace the other and who would get blown up quicker, and while Sean might be considered more athletic, Austin done more than hang in there with the heartbreak kid. A good, underrated match in my opinion that maybe deservedly gets a bad rep thanks to the finish. In many ways though, this one could be considered better than their WrestleMania match next year. The tag champs try to take cheap shots at each other but they decide to leave the ring together. They remain on high alert of each other, but they walk back up the ramp as we get ready for our main event. On the Raw following a cold day in hell, it was announced that Farouk would get a shot at the WWF Championship at King of the Ring. Farouk wanted to become the first African American WWF Heavyweight Champion, and he brought up the fact that the company had failed to give black wrestlers a chance in the past. Farouk even cut interviews with Vince McMahon where he would call out the chairman for the lack of opportunity presented to African American superstars. The leader of the nation wanted to make history tonight and set a new standard, but his very own faction were also having problems with Crush and Savio Vega failing to get along recently. As for The Undertaker, the WWF Champion, he's been forced to realign himself with Paul Bearer. Paul had blackmailed the Phenom, threatening to reveal a secret about The Undertaker's past that The Undertaker said himself would hurt too many people, so the dead man is now in a forced relationship with his former manager, much to his dismay. In terms of Farouk and The Undertaker crossing paths, yeah, it did happen, but it was all kept very basic and very standard. They had their own things going on with the nation falling apart, Farouk wanting to become the first black WWF champion, and The Undertaker having problems with Paul Bearer and whatever this secret was. Many would see this as an odd main event and many would see Farouk in 1997 as more of a mid card player in the World Wrestling Federation, but I think it's a good change of pace and it's good to see someone else get a chance in the main event. Farouk says history will be made tonight, we're looking at the first black champion in WWF history. He delivers an outstanding line when he says, Undertaker, don't worry about Paul Bearer's blackmail, you worry about this blackmail. Fantastic. Farouk makes his way to the ring with the nation while The Undertaker gets interviewed by Doc Hendricks. Doc wants to know how this secret has changed Taker's mental preparation for tonight, and Paul Bearer doesn't let The Undertaker speak. Paul says Undertaker has to remember that the secret hangs over his head. Paul's the one in control here and the Undertaker must do whatever Bearer says. The WWF Champion just walks away as Paul continues his rant. Taker makes his entrance, the crowd loves the dead man. Paul wants to take the Undertaker's coat but Undertaker refuses. He also refuses to give Paul the WWF belt and all this gives Farouk a chance to strike early. Farouk's advantage doesn't last long. Taker throws the challenger into the corner and he lays in the strikes, and over at the other corner Farouk goes down after a clothesline. A big boot and an uppercut from the Undertaker gets followed up with a pin attempt. Farouk kicks out and Paul tells Taker to hook the leg, Bearer is now telling the WWF Champion how to wrestle. Farouk hits a nice power slam on the dead man but Taker sits up afterwards. He makes his way towards the ropes where Savio and Crush launch an attack, but Farouk can't keep the advantage afterwards, Taker hits another big boot in the corner. We think Taker's gonna hit old school but he throws himself on top of the nation who were stood on the outside. The dead man wipes out the faction and Farouk ends up getting his neck snapped over the top rope. Taker then goes for the proper old school but Delo interferes, leading to Taker getting his little creature of the night smashed on the top rope. Farouk with a suplex, Taker with a clothesline, and more creature of the night abuse follows when Farouk hits a low blow. Farouk distracts Art Hebner and the nation attack Taker again. McMahon and JR talk about the shit officiating tonight at the King of the Ring. The match then goes to the outside and Farouk takes a great looking bump while holding the steps. They go back in the ring where Undertaker lands a few strikes, but then we see a pile driver from Farouk that also looked good. Chinlock from Farouk, this one stays in for quite some time. Farouk uses the ropes for leverage but it ends up getting broke with a jawbreaker from the dead man. 
Farouk gets the knees up when the champ goes for a splash, and then Farouk tries to end it with a dominator but it gets countered with a backdrop. Farouk gets a boot up in the corner but his aerial attack gets countered with a power slam, Undertaker then misses his jumping clothesline, and it's at this point where Crush pushes Clarence Mason and the nation begin fighting among themselves, completely out of nowhere. Farouk tries to make the nation fall in line but this distraction actually costs him the match, the Undertaker hits the tombstone and it's all over, Taker wins the king of the ring main event. This one didn't really build up to its ending, there was nothing wrong with what happened in the ring and there were some good looking spots but it just didn't flow too well. Undertaker hits chokeslams on Savio and Crush and then Paul Bearer forces the dead man to hit Farouk with not one, not two, but three chokeslams. Oddly enough, the decimation of Farouk leads to Ahmed Johnson coming out and questioning the Undertaker. Ahmed tells the champ to stop listening to Paul Bearer and then Ahmed hits the Pearl River Plunge on the dead man. Ahmed leaves, the Undertaker sits up and the Phenom goes to attack Paul Bearer but Paul gets out of the ring and our show comes to an end. This one kinda felt like an extended episode of Raw's War, the King of the Ring final was pretty good, Michaels vs Austin was good but it had a bad finish, and I really wanted to like Farouk vs Undertaker all these years later but it doesn't really go anywhere, it's not bad but it's not really good either. The show does get progressively better from the King of the Ring final onwards, but as mentioned earlier, the WWF's weekly Monday night show was proving to be more entertaining than their pay per view shows. Fortunately, that changes next month when the WWF presents Canadian Stampede, one of the best pay per views of the era and a show that's still very highly ranked to this day. Also, I've already covered that show, so if you don't mind skipping ahead in our Reliving the War timeline, you can watch the Canadian Stampede review right now. I won't be remaking it or anything like that because every match is covered, so yeah, check it out if you don't want to hang around. King of the Ring 1997 doesn't come recommended though. Slamboree 97 completely blew it out of the water, but as mentioned, we do have better WWF pay per views to look forward to from this point onwards. Thanks for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed this one, and I'll see you all next Thursday for Reliving the War episode 87. Take care. Thank <laughs> you.